confusing because all the fields were green and all the sorry the fields were blue and the rivers were green um, but it was a 3D map and it was rather a delightful view of Oxford to see it in that way but does very much show how Oxford is surrounded by hills um, and we're used to thinking of views of Oxford and the Oxford landscape so I'd like to sort of spin around and look a bit further before coming back in um, and first of all a very surprising Oxford landscape which you may be very familiar with. Um, you may know there's a blue plaque in the Banbury Road recording the fact that Paul Nash lived in Oxford for a while in the war. Um, and this is actually a painting of the Cowley landscape when the, um, all the, all the um, smashed plane, German planes were being recycled in the Cowley factory. Um, it's a very surprising and um, curious view. Of the Oxford landscape and we may be rather more used to historic views and um, as we just recently realized there's been a lot of discussion about whether the castle tower is Norman or Saxon um, the earliest Oxford seal produced in 1191 which is the earliest municipal seal in England does actually show the city with quite a few towers which is interesting because 11 in 1191 the university didn't exist um, so Oxford without the university was already a city of, um, as it were, of dreaming towers. But of course, the, with the appearance of the university, um, here famously illustrated on New College Misericords, uh, we have at the top what Tom Hassel always used to call the, um, the Oxford sausage machine, um, with uh, William of Wickham welcoming students to Oxford, passing through the machine and passing out the other side um, as, as benefice clerics. Um, and that's a lovely view of Oxford with bridges, gates, and absolutely recognisable the um, spire of St Mary's Church. But these are sort of private local views and Oxford only really hits the international scene with the publication of the Cities of the World Atlas in the 1570s, when there's a very famous view of Oxford, as it were from the Headington Road, looking down on the city. Uh, there are severe problems with this view because you can see Magdalen Bridge and you can see probably the castle in the background and the cathedral spire uh, but you can also I think see Osney Abbey over on the right um, and some towers in the wrong places um, and I sometimes wonder if Joris Hofnagel actually drew Oxford from both sides and then when he got back home forgot forgot which one he'd been looking at anyway it's a very nice view of Oxford and it shows the way that it nestles in the hills or we can jump forward to this imaginary view painted in 1689, which is actually a political statement about the Earl of Dartmouth and his role in the revolution. Uh, he, he was looking after the, Navy, the James's Navy as King Billy sailed up the channel with a Protestant wind. Um, but his grandfather had been the governor of Oxford in the siege of Oxford. And this is a wonderful battle painting done showing the siege of Oxford. Um, a very accurate representation of the, the city, which corresponds with the, the map, the famous map by Bernard de Gom. Uh, but it does have some delightful anachronisms in it, like it's got the Sheldonian theatre, which of course didn't exist in the Civil War. Um, but it's a nice landscape view of Oxford that shows it as it was really, unencumbered with um, suburbs and much immediate growth around it. David Loggan's series of college views in the 1670s um, was the first one to include formal views of Oxford from the east and from the southeast, um, sort of viewed from the hills looking down on the city. And views like this continued through and became the favourite subject of prints. So we have the Buck Brothers, um, or William Williams doing a sort of rerun of Logan, and then the Buck Brothers doing their view in the 1730s. Um, and I discovered to my delight on a visit to Cambridge that they've got the original of this view. And um, a bit like William Stukeley and all his views of Stonehenge, um, the Bucks were rather better artists than the engravers they had. Um, and the original drawing of this view is absolutely delightful and it's rather flattened out up by the engraver. So the, the landscape of Oxford quite early on became a subject for prints and prints that people would be expected to take out of books and stick on the wall 
um, to, to decorate their rooms. And one of the sort of perennial features, of course, is all the water around Oxford. Um, and this is a map prepared for some work we did at Yarnton. And this shows the very extensive um, river systems on the west of Oxford. Um, the word Wolvercote there is sitting on the top of Port Meadow, the great urban meadow which shares the top end with Wolvercote Common. Um, and that is sort of rough pasture. And inside that and beyond that are huge extents of hay meadows. And hay meadow is one of the most um, valuable pieces of land, uh, types of land use um, because it fed horses and then kept everything going. Um, and Yarnton had a particularly interesting series of hay meadows where even today, if they chose to do so, um, they could draw them by lot every year and the various landowners had rights to use them. Um, and the origins of that system was what was one of the things that was um, discovered in, in the extensive programme of archaeology at Yarnton. So Oxford's always had huge amounts of meadowland around it, and that's probably one of the reasons Oxford became a convenient place uh, for meetings and um, national events, as pe pe people would turn up with all their horses and, and get them properly fed. And the rivers also feature in art, and here is... Um, Jean-Baptiste Malcher, the German um, leader of the orchestra at the Hollywell Music Room, who was also an amateur artist, well, much more than an amateur artist. He was an artist and he taught art in Oxford in the late 18th century. Um, and there's a magical view of, um, probably of him on a drawing expedition, sitting in a boat past the ruins of Godstow Nunnery. And being Malcher, he's actually more interested in the haystacks than he is in telling us about the archaeology of that tower which of course is no longer standing. Um, but the river, and likewise with that view of um, probably towards Ifley on the Thames up above, um, views of Oxford on the Thames were, were frequent. So we have both Turners, the um, JMW Turner, the great national figure, and our local William Turner um, having a go at drawing Folly Bridge and the, uh, the, the London Wharf down there where all, all the goods came up the river and were offloaded in Oxford. And um, Turner also drew the Hythe Bridge, lovely drawing at the top there, and that was also used in one of Michelangelo Rooker's um, oil paintings of Oxford. Now Rooker is famous for having done the Oxford Almanac for about um, 20 years, which is the, the picture on the top of the university's annual um, calendar but he also did a number of rather fine oil paintings of Oxford. And this is one just above um, Hyde Bridge, which shows the canal entering into the river and also an early illustration of a boat station. And there's an undergraduate there sitting in a boat. Um, and there's an undergraduate on the shore um, entertaining his sister. Uh, and there's a dog, there's always a dog in a rooker print or, or a painting. So that's a very lovely, that's a very lovely view. And other artists were involved in producing almanacs. That one at the bottom is by Peter de Wint, and that was a view drawn for the Oxford Almanac. Um, and if anyone knows where the original is, we would love to know, because it was last heard of at the OUP headquarters in London, and it never came back to Oxford when the headquarters were closed. So somewhere out there, there's, there's a missing de Wint watercolour. But there's a beautiful engraving of it there, looking in over the, um, the Botley, well, it's, called, it's called Botley Mead, it's actually in Oxford, but it's named after the place in Berkshire. Um, and then William Delamotte, the local artist, also did a lot of views around Oxford. And William Turner was, our William Turner, was fascinated by views of Oxford. He's got a whole series of lovely watercolours um, of Port Meadow, famous view of Botley Mead under flood and this one is Botley Mead actually being um, mowed so it shows the and interestingly in the foreground there that stone is probably one of the markers of the different shots in the meadow because again it wasn't necessarily let by lot but the meadow was divided up into lots and different people owned different parts of it and that's the top left is Botley Mill um, which is still gone, but did survive as the George Inn and is still the Richer Sounds um, showroom on the end of the Botley Road by that tiny green gap between Oxford and Botley. 
And as we know, Oxford is and always has been prone to flooding. Um, rather amusingly, the, um, the railway flood up at the top uh, has continued to cause problems until very, very recently. They have finally raised the railway um, two or three feet to avoid that, that flooding. Um, and Oxford has flooded and always will flood. Um, and if you want to do something about it, there's very, very many streams around Oxford which were flood relief channels uh, which could be dredged and made to do their job uh, without spending a fortune on building some great flood relief channel, which I doubt is going to um, do much good, but that remains to be seen. So as well as the rivers and the meadows, Oxford, of course, had fields. Um, and by Oxford, I mean the bit between Port Meadow, the Thames and the Charwell, because beyond the Thames is Whiteham, which is in Berkshire, um, and beyond the Charwell are Cowley, Headington and Marston, which are not in Oxford until quite recently. They're all part of Bullingdon 100. Um, so Oxford's fields were up to the north of it. A Hollywell was something slightly different. That was a separate manor belonging to Merton College. But Oxford's fields were up in the north. And um, there are some views of those fields. Well, in fact, these are fields to the, to the south of Oxford. Um, rather nice Boydell print of um, a hay harvest taking place and you can't see it very clearly in the other print there there is a harvest taking place there's just an enlargement of it I've put there um, a bit like that famous picture in Gloucestershire of all the people at the hay harvest dancing across the fields um, there's a picnic taking place in the field but the main fields of Oxford itself were in Walton um, in North Oxford and if you flip that map around, we've got St Giles on the left and Wilvercote on the right. Um, so those are the Banbury and Woodstock roads and the central area of North Oxford, um, at least as far as Park Town and beyond, is where the open fields of Oxford were. And these were the strip fields, which are described in a survey in the 14th century, were still there at the time of this map in 1769 and were only enclosed in the 1820s. Um, and it was the enclosure that then became the basis of all the streets and developments. Um, but fundamentally, those are the fields of a place called Walton, uh, which was probably a little village down Walton Street. Though later on, um, the people who farmed the fields of North Oxford mostly lived in St Giles, which is why some of those houses have large yards and farms. And Hollywell was different. I'd say it belonged to Hollywell Manor. It had a much smaller area of open field and there's a lovely view there of a harvest taking place um, and it also included quite a, an area of parkland which is grass just um, grazing land um, and that's what became university parks so that the parks actually existed as part of Hollywell Manor um, and in fact there were walks laid out in it um, even before it formally became the university parks. So that's what we have in the immediate environs of Oxford. And if we go out into Oxfordshire, and this is just looking at the, um, <coughs> the mapping of the bio landscape of Oxfordshire, um, there are various mappings of land characterization. Um, but this one I think is quite useful because this does show the, the complexity of the Oxfordshire landscape. Um, and we are used to sort of looking down to the Chilterns one way and up to the Cotswolds the other. Um, but there's lots of varieties and bits of upland and bits of riverside um, and it really is an incredibly varied county with lots and lots of different types of landscape in it um, but a lot of those can be regarded as oxford landscapes uh, because people visited them you know right down to the 19 you know, until the invention of the bicycle most people took their exercise by walking out of oxford and were quite happy to walk you know, 10 or 15 miles to go and look at a Roman pavement or visit a country house. And all the early Oxford guidebooks include places like Ditchley and Blenheim and Newnham. Um, you'd, you'd probably go on a sort of carriage trip to those, but they were regarded as part of the um, sort of belonging to Oxford in that sense. The county also has some very striking and singular landscapes, um, one of which is Woods, Witchwood, um, over towards the west, north and west of Whitney. Um, and most of that has gone, but there's an incredible survival. Um, and if on Ascension Day you go on the path, you're allowed to go to the, to the well 
in the middle of Witchwood Forest, there is still an entire area of forest that does look like medieval forest, um, by which I mean large grassy enclosures with, with trees around them. Uh, it was captured on the Ordnance Survey drawing for the one inch map of 1811, and, and shortly after that completely disappeared. And I should say of this forest, as with the other ones in Oxford, um, you often read stuff about forests extending from sort of here to there and making them sound enormous. Forests always had very big legal boundaries um, to stop people cutting down trees and hunting. They nearly always had much smaller fixed boundaries. So it's quite likely that the actual boundaries of Witchwood Forest have not hugely changed since the medieval period. Um, and those boundaries did include villages and did include farmland. Interesting. Um, and yes, that's all the other trees. Yes, Chief Oxford. And then um, going the other way, of course, is that very singular landscape at Otmoor. Um, and if anyone is feeling expensive at the moment, that lovely Turner of Oxford drawing of Otmoor is for sale, um, which shows it under floodland. And Otmoor has come and gone. In aerial photographs, you can still see the original river channels. Um, it got enclosed, it got flooded, and it's had a great history. Um, but still, that landscape has preserved its singularity. Well, coming to the first of the country houses, Woodstock. Um, Woodstock was important as a royal manor, and the royal manor is um, there on the north side of the bridge. And this is actually a plate showing the echo. Um, and if you dare, you can walk into Blenheim Park from the town gate and stand where those two people are standing in the foreground and shout across the lake and just see how many times it comes back at you. Oh gosh. Quite surprising. I mean, the echo existed before the lake, but it has still survived after the lake. Um, well, of course, the poor, the um, Vanbrugh spent a lot of time and money rebuilding the manor, um, but Sarah Duchess got very angry about it and had it pulled down. So the manor is gone um, and the valley was eventually flooded uh, flooding a bridge that was actually meant to cross a canal rather, rather than a lake and this very grand landscape which everyone associates with capability of brown but this of course is a complete travesty of what was actually planned at Blenheim which wasn't Blenheim Palace it was called Blenheim Castle and Blenheim Castle was built for a military man and it had a military garden so to the south of the house there was a huge military garden um, with ramparts, with bastions, um, and that's the reason that the surviving kitchen garden is at a funny angle because it came off one side of the of those um, ramparts. Um, and I've recently discovered that the British Museum, British Library, has got 30 volumes of all the original building accounts, um, which include a lot of the accounts of creating that garden. Um, these have always been known, but no one's ever sort of pointed out the fact that they're there. Um, and it's an extremely well documented garden and was completely swept away by Capability Brown um, because it was much easier to manage grass than it was to manage these huge formal gardens. But I can't really join in, all the, in the excitement of what Capability Brown is supposed to have done to the English landscape when we've lost something as wonderful as that. But there we are. When we come south of, from Blenheim, um, we have another couple of oddities, Ensham Heath, a couple of heathlands. Um, a great open area of heathland between villages, uh, which means it can't have been good enough for arable, uh, it can't have been terribly good at producing grazing, so it's a rough area of heath um, centred there on Ensham Park. And then further over was Bladen Heath, just south of Bladen, um, and that still has, if you're prepared to trespass, a, an Iron Age hill fort in the middle of it, except it's not a hill fort, it's a flat valley fort. Um, extremely interesting monument um, and that's just between Begbroke and Bladen. So there are all these sort of funny little bits where things pop out um, and then just coming south we come to Yonton where I've talked about the Meads and the it, its own um, big Meads, West Mead and Oxley Mead and then Oxley and Pixie were actually common Meads shared between Yonton and all the adjacent parishes. Um, and that was quite common that in these sorts of areas of grazing, you might have them shared. We don't know much about Yarnton because it doesn't have, uh, infuriatingly, it doesn't have early records of the fields. 
Now we know there's a field called the sands and a field called the clays. Um, and this is particularly disappointing because the archeology span has pointed out some of the likely origins of the field systems in Yontem, um, showing that it's likely that these things were happening in the late Saxon period. Um, and the sort of pattern we're used to of open fields may already have existed by then. And Yonton is a classic sort of open field landscape. Um, you can stand now on the footpath on Frogwell Down, uh, looking over towards the hills, and there's a lovely Valley view, um, of pretty much that same view. So a classic Thames Valley, rather quiet, um, ordinary landscapes, but, but with a perfectly pleasant, uh, perfectly pleasant appearance. So if we come into Oxford and start getting on the hills, um, the sort of most famous one, first of all, is Elsfield, where Mr. Thomas of Thomas Photos um, famously took this wonderful photograph of enlarging uh, the view of Oxford, uh, which he got in the days before they started building tall buildings. Um, so it was rather a lovely view of Oxford. And it's always been a lovely view of Oxford. And it was um, more recently, John Buchan lived in Elsfield Manor, and um, oh, sorry, I've forgotten her name. The biologist lived there. Rothsch Miriam Rothschild lived there. Um, but the original owner, or one of the original owners, was Francis Wise. And he was a splendid man who was an antiquary who wrote books about coins. Um, and he had a garden at Ellsfield. And there's a little view of it in the bottom left there. And the garden had pyramids and pagodas and gothic chapels it was a sort of catch-all garden had all sorts of things in it and had a view of oxford and he was the first librarian of the radcliffe library what we call the radcliffe camera uh, which didn't actually have any books at that time and he said that as he all the statutes required him to do was to hold the key he wasn't actually required to admit any readers or buy any books i think he had rather a jolly time up at ellsfield looking at the view of oxford and not actually going down to um work in his library. And Elsfield, we do know about its fields, there's, um, there's maps there that tell us the, um, the field systems around it, and somewhere in the bottom right of Elsfield is a huge Roman villa that was dug up in the 19th century and has rather been forgotten ever since, and it must be, it is there on the bounds of Elsfield and Barton, and of course with all the modern developments around there, uh, this hill is beginning to be encroached on um, but it still does have views of Oxford and some of the worst tall buildings have been disappearing so the big biochemistry building which used to ruin that view has gone um, though of course nothing can be done about the John Radcliffe Hospital um, apart from painting it blue and green which is what I would do if I was in charge but there we are so we swing round from Ellsfield towards Headington um, and Headington has its the road coming into Oxford that people are very familiar with. It's got South Park, which was preserved by the Morrill family and eventually given by the Pilgrim Trust to the Preservation Trust, who then gave it to the city. And the top of Headington Hill was Pullen's tree. And Josiah Pullen used to walk up to the tree and walk down again. I think he stopped at the pub halfway down the hill, um, but that was his, his exercise. Um, and this has always been a famous view of Oxford and JMW Turner did it for one of his, the Almanac views. Um, and the road was actually, it was Cheney Lane that then became, so Cheney Lane came at an angle and then became Headington Hill. Um, but it did come down through, through a steep ravine. Um, and there's that pub halfway up the hill at the bottom. Now Headington's a bit difficult to follow, but the enclosure award for Headington for each area of enclosed land tells you which field it was in. So on this incredibly confusing drawing I've got Headington Field at the top which is where the main field was and then South Field at the bottom and South Park on the left um, and South Park was also a field because it's got Ridge and Furrow in it. Um, so those, those marked in yellow are the, where the open fields of Headington were. Um, but then the big bit in the middle where the Churchill Hospital is, which is in brown on my original map, is part of a whole ring of common land sur surrounding Shotover. So 
So that carried on at the top towards the A40, came down by the Churchill Hospital, and then swung around to Cowley, where it becomes Bullingdon Green. In fact, I think the whole thing was Bullingdon Green. There's a huge extent um, of, of rough land surrounding Shotover. And that in the um, Churchill Hospital area was the centre of the Oxford um, Roman pottery industry. And uh, not clearly shown on the map is the Roman road coming south, the Roman road from Alchester to Dorchester passed by this. Um, and so that rough land was where the clay came from that produced all those pots. And the, there's South Park, and there's a little view of South Park in the snow there, just showing up the ridge and furrow. So that was, um, that was part of the open fields of Headington. Um, and depending on how many trees there are, and the city loves planting trees in the middle of in the foreground of views, you have to move quite a way down the hill before you can get this view, uh, but you can get a lovely panorama of all the towers and spires. Um, and there is a Turner view um, of the South Park view at an earlier period. Out on Bullingdon Green, I say it's a very large extent that started in Cowley, went right up out to Horse Path, went right round to Headington, and it's where the um, the young bloods carried out their sport. So it's where people went riding and playing cricket and gave its name to the famous um, Bullingdon Club, um, whose members have been causing such havoc in this country over the last 15 years. Um, there they are sitting on the, um, sitting on the steps. So the Bullingdon Club originates on Bullingdon Green, which is part of this very large extent of um, open, rough, common land. So that came down towards Oxford onto Cowley Common and Cowley Marsh, um, extending down through Cowley Fields. And um, so in fact, the, where the road turns off to Cowley Marsh now is the beginning of that. And that's where you went up and out into the, this great area of common land. Um, and there's a magical view of it by William Turner, um, looking down Cowley Marsh and Oxford is just over to the right behind those trees um, and Turner loved drawing these views with sort of flocks of sheep in them so that's um, so in the distance we've got Cowley Fields but this up on top is all open um, is all open grazing in Cowley Marsh. Um, coming around the corner to Ifley the picture is slightly different because this is the latest publication which came out this week, The Archaeology of East Oxford, which is a marvellous report on this great community archaeology project that covered many aspects of East Oxford. And one of the things it does is look at field names. So I talked about the um, Headington fields, but this map shows the Cowley fields and as individual fields whose names are known and the area of the Littlemore fields uh, because Cowley has got some early estate maps there's a Christchurch map there's a wonderful Corpus Christi map which famously only shows the strips that the college owns so most of the map is white with little coloured strips on it um, so what this shows is we can see the layout of all those fields but the one thing we can't see is the layout of the Ifley fields because there isn't pre-enclosure mapping of the, the fields of Ifley. So we know from sort of county maps and large-scale maps, um, well, I mean small-scale maps, we know from small-scale maps where the Ifley fields were, but we can't actually put names on them or show where the, at where the strips were and which were the pasture closes. So that's rather, until somebody finds one, and there may be individual records that do show that, um, the, the fields of Ifley are a bit, a bit of a mystery at the moment. Shotover we know well, and Shotover, um, again, is a lovely Turner painting of um, gravel pits up there, and people dug fine clay for things like clay pipes, and the ochre pits where people got ochre for colouring. Um, and Hieronymus Grimm, the wonderful Swiss who came to England and travelled around, did a rather nice view of Oxford, uh, looking across from Shotover. So Shotover was another forest, and it was called Shotover and Stowe Wood, 
um, and Stowe Wood is further to the north. Um, and again, this was a forest which had theoretical bounds, um, which were quite large, but smaller areas in which hunting took place, which might or might not have trees. And obviously being accessible to Oxford was one of the places that people might go hunting. Um, and one of the reasons for Oxford being quite important in the 12th century and the university coming there is that the Kings of England regularly came to Oxford to go to Woodstock to hunt. And hunting was really very, very important. You did it every day, all day, um, and you constantly did it. So if you weren't going over to uh, Woodstock Park and Witchwood Forest, uh, you might be hunting in Shotover. And the actual boundaries of Shotover are, are quite precise and quite close. Um, and as you'll know, if you've gone up there, the old London Road runs right over the top of Shotover. Before the bypass was taken round on the A40 route, um, Cheney Lane just carried on and went up the top of the hill. I think you can still do it. You just drive along the top and drive down to Iffley on the other side. So Shotover, the forest was the bit on the top. And then it had this very interesting land use between it and that rough land below Bullingdon Green. It had all these woodlands. Um, open maudlin open and closed wood and all those other woodlands um, and the maudlin wood of course was the one that had belonged to the hospital of st john and they were given acres of woodland by the king and some of them were demean woodlands that belonged to the lord of the manor and the open woodlands were ones where people could go and take firewood um, and it's one of the big issues about the history of medieval towns is where they got their firewood from and recently we've had people at oxford archaeology looking at the charcoal from sites and they've discovered there's a changeover in the late medieval period to beechwood charcoal and that is highly likely meaning that there was less firewood available near Oxford and they're actually importing firewood from Henley and Henley and the Chilterns was the place that um, provided London with fuel so there were boats going up and down the Thames all the time from Henley delivering fuel to London um, and some of those must have been coming back up the river um, towards Oxford. So even Shotover has got quite a complex land, land use of sort of forest in the middle, woodlands around it, ring of woodlands around it, and then this ring of common land beyond that. And what is really interesting, if you read Druce, the botanist who wrote the botany of Oxfordshire, and then wrote the chapter in the Victoria County History on Forestry, which was published several years after his death. So I think it's published in the 18th, 1930s, but it was written in about 1910. And he says in his childhood, there weren't any trees on Shotover. So that's quite astonishing. Something we think of as a forest that we expect to be covered with trees, and it's got plenty of trees on it now, was very much a sort of acid heathland. Um, and this view, I believe, is a view looking back towards Wheatley across Shotover. So again, we've got a large expanse of sort of sheep walk on the top of a hill and probably acid heathland and not necessarily covered with trees at all. Right, well, if we go round to Newnham, um, and Newnham figures not just because it's the big country house down the Thames, but it was actually built for the view of Oxford. So the Palladian mansion built by Harcourt in the 1750s, shown in that bottom view, was specifically placed on the edge of the Thames to provide a view of Oxford. And the village, um, the village that was next to it, the deserted village was moved and Goldsmith's poem was thought to refer to, um, to the village of Newnham, which was disputed. Um, but there's a map that shows uh, the village, which was not right on the hill, but in, in the parkland just behind the house. Um, and famously, one, one woman was allowed to stay in her cottage while the rest were put away in a lovely new village built on the road, the Newnham Court near that we know today. But this was essentially a landscape enterprise in providing this very simple Palladian villa with this amazing view looking down the river towards Oxford. Um, later on, 
a church was built in the 1770s and the original landscape was amplified by the works of Capability Brown in setting out walks along the top of that ridge looking towards Oxford and as late as 1789 the Carfax conduit was taken down because it was a, got in the way of the traffic at Carfax and was rebuilt at Newnham. So it's an incredibly important landscape uh, which has a further phase of having a very very important picturesque flower garden created in, in the later uh, 18th century. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very complex really important landscape and um, but it was there because of its view of Oxford. And these are two views by Paul Sandby. And Sandby was a friend of the family and went there and helped them to draw. Uh, Lord Harcourt was something of an artist who did etching. Um, and this is the Sandby view of the house looking up the river. Um, and a version of that ends up on um, ceramics. There's a design called Newnham and Wild Rose, which shows the house on top of the hill with, with a boat and the river. And the other one is the designed view looking down the Thames towards Oxford. Um, a Thames which doesn't have any pylons, doesn't have any gravel pits that have had tree planting in them, but just a winding river um, looking down towards Oxford. And this was what was shown by um, Farrington in his views done for Boydell's History of the Thames. And there's a view, nearer view in the top there, but the view at the bottom is the Newnham view, and that's looking from just in front of the house, past the, the trees that don't obscure the view, looking down the river towards Oxford. And it's rather amusing that the original watercolour that the Ashmolean has got um, doesn't really emphasise Oxford. Um, I've got the pencil version, which is preparatory for the engraving, which shows Oxford a little more clearly, and by the time it's got to the engraving, the spires of Oxford are showing very clearly in the background. But they were always there to be seen. Um, if you go to Newnham, it's something of a disappointment because that wonderful church was built um, with a great north porch, which is blank, but it's got a seat in it. And the reason that north pediment was built was you sat in the marble seat looking at the view of Oxford. You can't see it. Uh, if you can see anything, it's pylons. Um, down the hill is the modern Lord Harcourt's garden, but right in front of you is a huge Wellingtonia that would have been planted in the 1860s, which totally obscures the view. Um, and even if you did remove all those trees in the garden, um, somewhere round about Sainsbury's on Hayford Hill, someone has planted a huge swathe of poplar trees going all the way down the hill to the river. And that's what finally um, removes the view of Oxford. So here's an incredible, marvellous 18th century planned view of Oxford that has been completely destroyed um, by pylons and tree planting. Um, and it's only the greatest difficulty that you can actually see um, Oxford from Newnham. You have to walk sideways past all the trees and come out the other side. Then we pop back across the river and a bit nearer Oxford, we come to Bagley Wood. But this is quite an interesting early case of um, sort of concern about the countryside because Bagley Wood like Shotover was a place people went to walk and at some point in the 1820s I think St John's College closed it off um, and there's huge complaints in guidebooks about how the college has cruelly closed off this wonderful bit of countryside. Um, it is rather more accessible now and the college lets people in um, but the woodland although it's been used for a lot of research on um, bird life and, and other natural forms does not still have the ancient woodland that it did have except perhaps in small parts. And Bagley Wood is of course the wood, it's an Abingdon Abbey wood um, and it's in Radley, it's part of Radley um, and in fact the Preservation Trust at the moment is being offered the north tip of it uh, which is rather interesting next to some other land it has in Hinksey. But um, Bagley Wood may also be another source of firewood for Oxford as much as Abingdon. Then when we come north, we come past all the Hinkses, um, South Hinksey and North Hinksey. Um, and the first view we come to is 
Turner's famous view that he painted um, to be engraved by Mr. Wyatt, the print seller. Um, and Tur Turner, of course, wasn't famous for his paintings. Turner was famous for the prints that were made from his paintings. And that's what people knew Turner from, uh, not from his watercolors and not from his original oil paintings. Um, and Turner knew this view from being a young man because his uncle lived at Sunningwell. And when you come from Sunningwell in o to Oxford, you come on the old Abingdon Road, you turn the corner, and if you clamber over the hedge, this is the view you get. Uh, so this is a view looking down one of those dry valleys towards Oxford um, and towards the spires. And it was very famous. It, it, it was produced as a print and was a very famous view. If you then look for it, you have rather an interesting experience. Um, because the way to find views of Oxford is to follow Tom Tower. And because Tom Tower is forward of all the other spires, it, by parallax, it moves quite quickly across the scene. So if you go into that field, you can move from the left and to the right until Tom Tower is just to the left of All Saints Church. And then to get the horizon, you move up and down the hill until you get into the right place. And they have very kindly, in the planting they've recently done in this field, they've very kindly left a gap um, for what they believe is the view of Oxford that Turner drew. But in fact, they haven't done their homework properly. And if you do find Turner's view, uh, there are tree planting in front of it. Um, so someone's actually spent money in the fond belief they're planting wonderful trees in the Oxford landscape, um, and they're actually obscuring uh, one of its most famous views. And then we go further north, and Turner did a lovely view from the Hinksy Conduit House, um, and that you can still go and see. Um, it's a scheduled monument with some rather strange opening hours, um, but you can get to that and almost get something of a view from Oxford over the bypass. The best place to go actually is the golf club. And if you haven't been to the golf club, do go to the golf club because you're welcome to go there and walk in its woods. And there are a tremendous series of Oxford views from its car parks um, as, as you advance. But they're quite lengthy and as you advance through the car park, the views change all the time. Um, so there are some thrilling views there. And um, of course, everyone has, has drawn this view and there's the Turner of Oxford one. And then this wonderful one by Russell Flint. Um, now we all think of Russell Flint as sort of painting Spanish ladies in the tedious quantity of endless, endless prints of dancing ladies. Um, but he was a perfectly good artist and did this magical view of Oxford from Chilswell Farm, which was done from illustrated Matthew Arnold. Um, back in the 1930s, I think. And I'd love to know where the original of that is because there's only this one reproduction of it in, in the book. But it is a very glorious view of Oxford. And then the next thing we come to is Boar's Hill. Um, and Boar's Hill was very famous because poets lived there and everybody thought it was so wonderful having this hill that poets, this wild hill that poets lived on and everyone rushed to go up and live there and lots of people built big posh houses there. And there's the famous Dirk Bogard film Accident which is located on Balls Hill um, and Lord Barclay built his house there and I believe that his tower on his house must have been actually built as a prospect tower to see the view of Oxford and famously the view of his golf club was one of the first purchases by the Oxford Preservation Trust um, to, to preserve a very famous view of Oxford, which still is magical. You stand there and the sun passes across and one second it's grey and the next minute it's gleaming sunshine. Um, and there's not only the stone seat at the top, there's another, there's a Gilbert Murray seat in a little copse a little way down the hill. Now these Boar's Hill views were written about by Matthew Arnold, um, who wrote poems about walking round Oxford. And in his Scholar Gypsy, um, the Scholar Gypsy, who was once a scholar, um, walks the Berkshire Ridgeway, looking down on the Oxford he knew, and looking down at the dreaming spires and the lights in Christchurch Hall. And he looks across the hill to the stripling Thames at Bablock Hive, and looks down to the Berkshire Downs. Uh, the Gypsy has extensive views across this landscape. Um, and Henry Taunt very helpfully provided a guidebook with 
uh, photographic illustrations. So you could get you could do a sort of Matthew Arnold walk with Taunt's illustrations and visit all these places. He then wrote another poem, um, Thyrsis, which commemorated the death of his great friend Arthur Hugh Clough um, in the 1860s, with whom he had walked the hills. And so he has the famous description of going up the walking up that track by Chilswell Farm, which is one of these dry valleys that goes up the hill, and the signal elm on the top of the hill that they walk towards, um, and looking down on the sweet city with her dreaming spires. The elm has recently been um, purchased by the, um, and its field has been purchased by the Preservation Trust, but it's not actually an elm, it's an oak tree. Um, and the reason it was a signal elm, it was the only tree that was there, um, because there weren't trees on the top of Boar's Hill, it's heathland. Um, and this bit of the Ordnance Survey map um, shows Boar's Hill as the common land of Wootton. So Wootton was down in the valley, and you came up to the top of the hill, and there was heathland which was later divided up between all the farms. When it was enclosed, it was divided into large areas between all the farms. And again, if we go back to Matthew Arnold's, sorry, to Torn's photographs, you can see that quite a lot of the top of Boar's Hill was indeed acid heathland and wasn't covered in trees, um, but, but was open, open heath. And because of the poets living there and because of people wanting to live there, everyone was buying up land to build houses. And Arthur Evans, who had a, his own house on Boards Hill, uh, was very concerned about the loss of the views. And so he built John Mound. He also built an ecological garden, which is extremely interesting with different little ecosystems in it, which is now completely dilapidated. Um, but the idea of John Mound was that with all these tr houses and gardens appearing, you could still look at the Dreaming Spires, you could still look at the Stripling Thames of Bablock Hive, and you could still look over to the White Horse. And in fact, there was, and there's a replica now, there was a brass plate on top of John Mound, which allowed you to look at all these views. Well, that's all very wonderful, but as people grew trees in their gardens, um, and the heath, the John Heath, which belongs to the Preservation Trust, has all grown up. Uh, that is the view at the top of the Dreaming Spires. And that is the view at the bottom of the Stripling Thames at Bablock Hive. The views have been totally destroyed by uncontrolled tree growth um, and, and cannot be restored with, without fairly... Um, so, so this is even when you go to the top of John Mound to look at the views, they are obscured by, by tree growth. Um, and you'd have to persuade a lot of uncomfortable people that they really ought to take down that nasty fir tree in their garden and cut the tops off the next three trees um, to bring back that view of the dreaming spires. And likewise at Cumna, um, and this is part, this is just an extract from John Hansen's wonderful um, history of the Cumna landscape where he reconstructed it over the century, uh, over the centuries. Um, and again, Cumna Heath, the whole of the top of Cumna Hill was a heath. Uh, there at the bottom, you have Matthew Arnold's, um, well, sorry, the taunt photograph of what Matthew Arnold talks about, of the little clump of pine trees on top of Cumna Hill, Cumna Hurst. And there at the top, it is today covered in woodland. Um, although there is, um, they, they have got cattle in there at the moment. So there's an attempt to get some of that back to heathland. Um, so Arnold's landscape of the lonely tree against the sky and the fir, trop, the fir topped hearst uh, of Cumna have both completely disappeared um, along with those views from Whiteham and Shotover. Sorry, Newnham and Shotover. And then finally Whiteham, which is in a class of its own, um, where it belongs to the university and it's a sort of huge open laboratory. Um, to which everyone has access now by, by requesting permission, which still has lovely views of Oxford across the, um, the grounds of the Abbey. Um, and a parkland that was given by the Fennell family to the university specifically to preserve it oh. in memory of their daughter. And itself, Whiteham is quite complicated because there is a woodland up there, but there was also a large bit of common um, 
belonging to Whiteham, and there were also open fields. So a large part of Whiteham, the, the fields actually went from the abbey right up the hill, and then there was common, common land of Whiteham and Cumnor, and then going round to Radnor Common on the other side. So there's a huge area of common land, most of which is now covered in trees. So Whiteham Woods are a fascinating mix of bits of ancient woodland and bits of regrowth on common land, um, and probably some growth on, on open fields as well, um, which really summarizes the whole, the, the sort of changes that have taken place, um, even with sort of totally benign ownership there. So that is a sort of rapid, rapid dance around the, um, the landscapes of Oxford. They are fascinating, they're enjoyable, even if you don't know, know their history. I think they become even more enjoyable if you do know something of their history. Um, and just finally to say, one of the most astonishing things about Oxford itself, it has almost no footpaths. This is a copy of the CPRE 1920s map, and there's hardly a single footpath in the city of Oxford. It's quite astonishing. I can't imagine why, um, but they don't exist. So what Oxford needs, um, it needs a few more footpaths, it needs rather fewer trees, it needs very many fewer pylons, and there are still just one or two tall buildings that I'd be rather happy to see disappear. And there you are, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Julian, for a, a, a wonderful tour of Oxford, uh, even uh, iconoclast iconoclastic of trees, <laughs> I now totally see your point about that, uh, and you've really given us a very rich picture um, of uh, uh, what there is to to see. I felt like sort of rushing out straight away and going for a very long walk <laughs> to uh, uh, to look at some of this. It's very inspiring in that way, and uh, I'm sure will help us through uh, the days of autumn. Uh, uh, and any potential further restrictions, but we can all go out for rather solitary walks and explore this amazing landscape, uh, which is, as you say, extremely buried and very complex. Uh, now, nobody has sent me a question for uh, for you on on chat. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Um, if anyone would like to ask Julian a question. Uh, don't unmute yourselves all at once, but um, <laughs> if anyone's got a burning question for Julian, now is the time to ask him in person. No, they're all being very shy. Perhaps people are speaking with their microphones on. <laughs> Anyone would like to ask Julian a question? You have to unmute yourselves. Could I? This is oh, Hillary. that was Hillary. Hello. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. It's really, it's not quite so much a question. There is a connection between Shotover and Ifley in that in the first half of the 13th century, we had an anchoress here, the Lady Honora de Brose. Yes. And Henry III gave her regular, not usually annual, sometimes the gap, gifts of wood from Shotover. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's, all, it's, it's, also, it's also a very interesting matter of translation as to whether it means timber for, for building, putting into buildings, or whether it means wood for putting in your fireplace. I um, pretty, there's, there's, there's mostly the terms, because there's one, I, I went all the way through the uh, the open roles um in in the body and looking yeah. at this yeah. and um and looking at other gifts of wood because you know, for instance some went to the franciscans which is another interest of mine that's right yeah there's usually for building those ones those were clearly building yeah. but the ones to Nora do generally seem to be for firewood yeah and it was tremendously important because you know once you've once you've used up your sources in the parish, you do need to go elsewhere for your brushwood and your, and you could buy it in Oxford Market, you know, there's a, plenty of people selling it there. 
Yeah, but she's an anchoress and she's yes. been given this as an express gift. By right. Yes, yes I'm sorry, I get forest. your point. Yes. In the royal forest, so he's ordering the yeah. steward yeah. to give her specified amounts of yeah. firewood. Which shows that she had a fire in her um, the fireplace in her house. I think they usually would. Yeah. Yes. And Anchorage, Anchorage usually had a, because you were stuck there. I mean, you had to have something. Well, indeed, yes. Yeah. I have a um, question for you, Julian, from Anne Dighton, which has come in oh. on the chat line. Yes. Uh, how much of the land we have looked at is now owned by the university? And is common land uh, actually common land uh, for all? Um, Whiteham belongs to the university. Newnham, I think they, they've either just so I think they've sold Newnham. Yes. They have sold it, but the house is still on a long lease. Um, Christchurch owns bits of well, the colleges own bits of um Ellsfield and Marston. Shotover mostly belongs to the city. The only common land in all of this, I think, is Port Meadow and Wolvercote Common, and, and that's, al although that's you can common for everyone, is it? You can walk on it, and it belongs. Well, the Freemen of Oxford say it belongs to them. The city says it belongs to them. It has ownership, and there are people who have rights to graze cattle on it. But everyone can walk across it. Um, but you can't go and light a bonfire on it, which is what people love doing in hot weather or <laughs> barbecues. Um, but yes, it, it has common access for all. But places like Whiteham and Bagley, um, you know, the owners are fully entitled to close them off and, and not let you in. I, I have a related question on the chat uh, line from Caroline. Mm. My pond. When and why did Port Meadow become managed by its commoners? Uh, not because King Alfred gave them a charter. Um, it's mentioned, it must be the common mention in Doomsday when it says that all the burgesses of Oxford had um, common of pasture outside the walls. So it is likely to go right back to the origins of Oxford when the burgesses probably had their own land in the fields. They certainly had burgess mead where they could grow their grass and they were then at some very early stage they were given the grazing on port meadow susan yes uh could i put a question yes indeed. Um, it's about a name actually it's about the name of cowley i believe it's kufa's lee is that, is that correct in that's which correct. case who is kufa uh, <laughs> just one of those um one of those, one of those of things. middle to late Saxons who gives his name to a village. Yes, um, he's a Saxon landowner, isn't he? Yes. There's, there's a mural about him uh, in the Temple Cowley uh, shopping centre. Yes. Which uh, sets out a little bit of this history. And we, we used to take our cat to a vet which was, whose clinic was called Kufa's Lee. Oh, really? uh, but uh, alas, the clinic has has since been demolished uh, and we've had to find another vet but um uh i think that's right he's a saxon yes uh, figure of some significance in cowley isn't he because the other thing uh, you've got you've got a grove field name haven't you in ifley and there's a number of groves yes. around oxford there's a binsey grove there's a medley grove uh, there's E Grove down at the bottom of um, the Abingdon Road, and I think there are a series of little wet wood, very often wet woodlands. Um, where yes, your there's Grove is Grove House on Ifley Turn. Is that is that's that right? What you're yes. Thinking of? Yes. And these are sort of curious small patches of woodland that survived in the urban context. But just if you think of the number of people living in the city cooking either heating or cooking on wood every single day or even charcoal there must have been a huge requirement for the stuff to come into yes. the city yes 
Indeed. Oh, Susan? Yes. Uh, Meg. Oh, it's Meg. Yes, hello. Yeah. Um, on the subject of firewood, um, James of Spain, who is uh, recognised as one of the co-founders of Oriel, um, received gifts from Edward I between 1281 and 1291 of, of fuel and bucks and does from royal forests, including Shotover, Brill, Witchwood and Burnwood. Yes. <laughs> Did you have to go and get it or was it delivered? <laughs> I think it must have been delivered to him because he lived in a, um, he was granted a big house by Eleanor of called yes. um, La or Le Oriole. Um, yes. And uh, that, which of course eventually became absorbed into Oriole College. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes. But it's very interesting, someone did research on the Verney family mm. um, in the 18th, well, yes, the 18th century. And it's extraordinary how late gifts of deer survived mm -hmm. as a way of you know helping your political friends and um spurning your enemies yes and it's very important to whom you gave gifts of, of deer and anyone who had a park did that quite regularly but it's interesting that it should be it should include witchwood and brill mm -hmm. um which yes. of course were all in the royal um yes. domain he was also awarded a lot of deer for his graduation in 1291. He was very oh, much yeah. favoured by Edward and Eleanor. And he was, um, you know, I, I find out that he was an, an illegitimate son of a younger brother of um, Alfonso the Wise, which J Jeremy Cato didn't know. Oh, that's very interesting. You mean that's not in the college history? No, I told Jeremy. And oh, was, right. Yes. He, he didn't put it in. That's very, very interesting. Thank you. Like we can, I can tell you more about that if you're interested. I, I would, I am interested, yes. Uh, well, let, let, perhaps we can exchange emails, yes, yeah, indeed. Mm. Um, have I got an email? Well, Susan can give me, I, I can yeah. sort that out for you, mate. No okay. problem. Fine. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, enable this um, wonderful exchange of knowledge. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? You can always send them later by email to Susan if you yes. <laughs> dare not speak now. Well, I'm not going to offer to do that in perpetuity, <laughs> but I'll do it for a bit. At the bottom, you can see the chat. Could I ask a question? Yes, Mark. Um, I'm just thinking about the um, the Saurimi family who were lords of the manor in Italy yes. in the 12th century and they were subject to forest fines yeah would they likely have been hunting or claim to the king claim to hunting at shot over do you think they might have owned dogs that hadn't been um hadn't had their toes clipped or they might have cut down trees um which would have affected the sort of general amount of tree growth so there's control over both those things, over tree cutting, tree felling and ownership of dogs. So you could break the forest law without actually ever going into the forest and poaching, as it were. But having said which, it's entirely likely they did go poaching in the forest. Yes. Because if the king wasn't there, who, who was going to stop them? Yes. Um, Thank you. Mm. Any more questions? Well, it's very strange doing this talk because I don't get any reaction from you. But <laughs> no. There's no. still quite a few of you there. Reaction. I'll tell you what we will do at this point. Yeah. We will all unmute your, ourselves and give <laughs> Julian a great big round of applause. Yes. And thank yes. you very much for a great thank talk. You. Thank you, Julian. Well, thank you very much for, for staying there. So that's... Uh... Well, uh, it's been very edifying indeed. And... Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it obviously, is is the sort of tip of the iceberg of a great yeah. iceberg of research that you've put into yeah. this. Mm. And I like to think of you tramping round all these um, uh, amazing uh, um, places and getting. Uh, uh, it's a bit sad to think of you getting very frustrated <laughs> by trees and pylons, as you did. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. <laughs>
but, um, there's plenty of lovely trees as well so it's uh, yes i mean some of the trees are a joy it has of to course be they are i'm going to cut mm. them all down no uh, it's just very specific just off. very specific little um yeah. areas of snipping yes mm. so um thank you very much julian that was really terrific well thank you for asking uh, me it's been so so sorry i can't offer you tea or a drink in the pub as <laughs> i would otherwise have done um but uh, it's been great to see you and to see all of the friends of St Mary's on, on Zoom who've joined us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 That's it. Um, I'll be in touch with you a bit later. Yeah, sure. okay. just, just one or two thank queries. You. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.